Probably more recognizable is this. This is rice china. It has this dragon pattern on it and then the grains of rice. I'm going to show you what makes rice china unique. I'm going to take a flashlight here, turn it on, and as you can see here, the light shines through the rice grains. Don't ask me how they do it, but that's how it works. On all rice china, that is how it works. As you can see here, the light shines through. Another little piece here. I don't know how they do it. It's bone china, yes, but I don't know how they do it. One final piece here. Yep. And on the rice bowl for serving the rice, you can see the light shining through. That's what makes rice china unique. Having this stuff is not a requirement by any means. You can get away with having a sauce cup be a tiny little glass cup or a custard cup. You don't have to have any of this. But it does help having little bowls so when you're doing your preparation for your stir fry, your sauce ingredients or your chopped ingredients can go into bowls and everything can be ready to go so that when you go to stir fry you're all ready to go. This is for doing cooking and for serving. Because you're often going to need to have all your prepped ingredients in containers. You've measured out chilies for your Mongolian beef. You can put them in a little dish like this. The other striking china that I have sitting here is this. This is Canton Rose. This is blue Canton Rose china. And painted as well, this is China. This is special restaurant china. This came from a restaurant in Santa Cruz that's no longer operating. The China Szechuan restaurant. I found these at a local antique shop in Santa Cruz decades ago. And it's beautiful china. And this is completely safe to eat out of. This one, as you can see here, it has a repair. And this one and this one also have repairs. I did the repairs, so they're not as good as whoever repaired this rose medallion china. But it's beautiful stuff. And every bowl has a use. This bowl right here, this is a rice bowl. This is for serving rice on the side. What this is here, this is technically the lid for a rice bowl, but it also works the best as upside down as a condiment dish. You'll put a swab of Chinese mustard and maybe a swab of chili. These are also rice bowls, just slightly larger, or a small soup bowl. Other good dipping sauce bowls like these. Real tiny ones. I also have some blue Canton Rose little bowls like this, the tiny ones. This is another condiment dish and has things on either side for condiments. This is also great for stir frying. You have your garlic and your ginger measured out. I also have a couple of clear white ones. Condiments. Another style of dish. Maybe serving tea. These are hand painted tea cups here. These are the fish logo tea cups here, which is really old pattern. And they're very cool looking tea cups. We're serving a stir fry. You're going to want these oval plates. These are Chinese oval plates. They have this decoration on them. But you can totally use any oval plate will work. And oval plates are the best. It looks attractive when it's mounded up on there. This is another Asian dish. 
got this from my mother many years ago. Also a great dish for serving. And just looks cool. It's got this brown exterior with the blue on the inside. We're serving rice. This is a common parcelain rice rice bowl for serving the rice and has a lid. This is the same but one made out of rice china. This had a lid at one time but when I found it it did not have the lid with it. But it still works and it's great for serving rice. You can also serve rice out of a clay sand, clay sand pot. When you're making the sticky rice it can be served out of that sand pot or you can take the rice out and serve it in a rice bowl like this. We're also going to need tools to serve Chinese food. And I'll set them out here. Rice. These are rice spoons. This is a dark bamboo rice spoon. This might be a teak bamboo rice spoon. Yeah, that's what this is. This is a teak one. And these are the plastic ones. Very easy to use. This looks more attractive when you're serving. It's for serving steamed rice and for serving sticky rice. For serving sauces, these are not Chinese, but American silver plate little ladles. Great for sa serving sauces and condiments. But my favorite are these right here. These are Chinese silver serving spoons. These are high grade Chinese silver, what would be equivalent to our sterling silver here. I think this means good luck or good fortune that some Chinese symbol on here. I can't remember exactly what it means. But it's something to do with good luck or good fortune. These are made out of Chinese silver. I got a whole set of them. There's three, six, seven, nine of these. But are really useful is these wide, bold, regular spoons. These are not Chinese as well as these spoons here. Perfect for serving Chinese food and it holds more. This takes some getting used to and you take a little bit out at a time. Also can be used for serving condiments. When serving noodles or serving a salad, I would recommend just using a regular set of tongs, like so. I would not recommend utilizing them. Don't use a spoon to serve. You could use a spoon and a Western style fork to serve salad. Last but not least, you're gonna want chopsticks. And you're gonna want a soup spoon. These are porcelain Chinese soup spoons. These are classic restaurant chopsticks. Grab a pair here and show you. These are the ones I like personally. And you take the chopstick. I'm going to show you this little secret here. We got our first chopstick resting, going through our thumb, which is holding it in place, and hitting our index finger. And then we place the second chopstick resting against the pointer finger. And then the only chopstick that pivots is the one, the top chopstick pivots. So when you're in your bowl, you can pick up little pieces, whether on a plate, when you're in a rice bowl, you slide underneath and you can pick up bits of rice. When you're on a plate and eating fried rice, 
that's a bit harder to deal with and you slide underneath and you pick up a little bit. It takes some getting used to, but it's very easy to work with chopsticks. Used to be able to do it in my other hand here. It's just different. Let's see if I still can. I can do it a little bit, not as good as I used to. You might be accustomed to wooden chopsticks, but these are easy to maintain and clean. They also make bread ones that are pretty popular, but I like these. They're designed to look like ivory, but they are plastic, so you're not harming the environment and you're not doing anything harmful to elephants, which we shouldn't be doing anything harmful to elephants. Elephants. That's how to use the chopsticks. You may have seen the helper chopsticks. And they often do that with a rubber band and the wooden chopsticks. And then they use the packaging, the wooden chopsticks came in in between and then it's a helper chopsticks. That's cheating in my opinion. If you can't use chopsticks or your fingers aren't strong enough, just use a fork. Nobody's gonna harm you for it. The other one we looked at was a Chinese soup spoon. This can also be used for serving sauces as well. And you may also see larger Chinese soup spoons that can be used for serving. I don't own one of those. But this, a little larger than this really old rose medallion model here, which is for display. I would never use that rose medallion soup spoon for anything. This is beautiful and easy to use. When you're serving wonton soup or any other type of Chinese soup, this is wonderful. This is a wonderful bowl to serve Chinese soup in. This is the perfect size to serve your small portion of soup. You can also use a bowl like this to serve your Chinese soup in. You just need to be careful if it's thinner china like this. You just need to be careful with it. You could also serve soup in these smaller rice bowls here. Even if you wanted to serve a very tiny serving of soup that you could take in one or two bites for a tasting menu that was Chinese in flavor, you could do it in here. You could even do a Chinese soup shooter and have it all in here. Maybe it's one small wonton and this beautifully flavored broth and you take it in one go. Rice will often be served on the plate, but sometimes you'll have a rice cup on the side. And that is this. With the exception of the rose medallion china, everything is perfectly safe. And the rice china, all this stuff can go in the dishwasher. Items like this and this, the Canton Rose China, should be hand washed. Stuff like this small stuff, make sure it goes on the top rack of your dishwasher and not on the bottom. These large bowls would fit on the bottom of your dish rack. And if you own any rose medallion china and it needs to be cleaned, carefully washed by hand, especially stuff like this, wash it by hand. These can go in your dishwasher, perfectly safe. When dealing with all of this stuff, Chinese soup spoons, your stainless steel, regular spoons, plastic rice spoons, they can all go in the dishwasher. Wash chopsticks by hand. Wash anything silver by hand. Including these, wash them by hand. This will work in your dishwasher easy. As will the rice bowls will also work in your dishwasher. You just need to be careful where they put them. Small stuff needs to go on the top shelf of your dishwasher. 
you don't want things to break in your dishwasher. So that is our look at Chinese serving pieces, beautiful serving pieces. And again, you don't need any of this. You could do it all with whatever you have. If you don't own any oval platters, any normal over platters, you could serve your food on round platters and it would be fine. You can also serve larger portions of Chinese food. You can use large quilt and armatol platters for beautifully for serving Chinese foods and a great for serving Chinese barbecue. Let's say you roasted a duck and you made some Chinese barbecue pork and some spare ribs. Great served on those armatol platters. When we come back, we're going to talk Chinese pantry ingredients and refrigerator pantry ingredients. Welcome back to the well-equipped kitchen, and I have my Chinese pantry in front of me. Everything that's required, this is stuff that can be kept on hand. And we're going to go through it all for you today. Main staple of Chinese cuisine is rice. First of all, what I have here, this is jasmine rice. The jasmine rice is the best for steamed rice and for making fried rice. This is sweet rice. I'm going to pull out a few grains here so that you can see what it looks like. As you can see here, it is very short, stubby grains. This is used for preparing congee, which is rice porridge, also known as juk, as well as preparing sweet rice, the dish called sweet flavored sweet rice, also known as sticky rice. The other item are noodles. These are dry cellophane noodles, which you often see fried crispy, and they're used as a garnish for different things like Mongolian beef. This is the fresh noodles. This one is the steamed chow mein noodles. This one requires just to be soaked in hot tap water before being stir fried or stirred into soup. But this is great for chow mein. This is also what they use to make the Hong Kong pan fried noodles. We're next gonna talk about some fresh ingredients here. And here they are, scallions. You will also see Chinese chives and yellow chives and flowering chives and garlic chives. I may bring, use some of those in some of the recipes later on down the road and we'll talk about them. But the most common item you can keep in your fridge is regular chives. This is garlic, but it's Chinese garlic, shallot. This is young ginger, as you can see it is young. It just needs to be rinsed and can be used as is and not peeled if you chop it fine enough. This is the regular ginger, which also for certain preparations in Indian cuisine, they won't peel it, but they'll wash it well. But this, for what we're doing, it's best if it's peeled. This is Virginia ham. You might ask why Virginia ham? This is a country ham from Virginia, also known sometimes as Smithfield ham, which is where some of the best country hams come from. This is the substitute for the Chinese, what they call golden coin ham. Chinese ham is famous, but you can't get it here. And I don't think many producers make it anymore. So that's why they use the Virginia ham. It's a perfect substitute and delicious. This is Chinese lop chong sausages. I don't have any Chinese bacon here, but I have used Chinese bacon in the past. It looks like regular bacon, but it's one usually one piece. It's a thicker slice, maybe about the size of a regular rasher of bacon, but it's a lot thicker, maybe like two or three times the thickness of a regular slice of bacon. Of the thick slice bacon, it's like three thick slices of bacon on top of each other. And it is dark because it often contains molasses and other ingredients and it's much more strongly flavored. These are dried chilies. Whenever you get spicy food, this is one of the ingredients. Another popular flavoring is the dried tangerine peels. 
coming to the back here, cornstarch, or sometimes potato starch, or wood starch. The starch is very important. Very important in the chicken velveting process, which happens with chicken, pork, beef, and shrimp. Used also for making batters and making things crispy. Next we'll talk about here, Shaoxing rice wine. This is the extra aged Shaoxing rice wine. And this is the normal Shaoxing rice wine. This one is actual Shaoxing rice wine that could be drank. This one here is the Shaoxing rice wine that contains salt. This contains a little salt. And what that does is it renders it useless as a beverage. Shaoxing rice wine is a common item for cooking purposes. We're going to go here, back here. Vinegar. This is the common rice wine vinegar. This is red color vinegar, which is a seasoned vinegar. It's also made from rice wine vinegar, but it is colored red. This is commonly used with dim sum. In the back here, this is black vinegar. It has a stronger, more complex flavor. In some recipes, they'll use both black vinegar and rice vinegar for its complexity and for the brightness and acidity from the regular vinegar. This is another black vinegar, black rice vinegar. This one is more like, both, a little bit like balsamic vinegar, and balsamic vinegar has been known to be acceptable as a substitute. This is a sweetened vinegar. It means it has sugar in it. Chinese soup stock, which we will talk about in the next episode, we're going to talk about Chinese soup stock. This is an acceptable substitute for Chinese soup stock. It doesn't have the exact same flavor. This is a straight chicken soup. The one we're going to be making homemade has ham in it along with the chicken. But this is a good substitute to have in a can. I recommend this rather than using a regular store-bought Western chicken broth. It's not the same. The flavor is different. You could use it if you had to, but it's not the same. Next we're going to talk about is soy sauce. And most people would recognize this bottle. This is in fact the Japanese bottling of Kikoman all-purpose seasoning. This is all-purpose soy sauce. This is what they mean when they say thin soy sauce. And if this is what you have in your refrigerator, when a recipe calls for thin soy sauce, you can go ahead and use this. This is the Chinese, premium Chinese thin soy sauce made by Lee Kum Ki. This is wonderful stuff. On a rare occasion, you'll find a recipe calling for white soy sauce. What the difference between these are, soy sauce is made from wheat that's been roasted, soybeans, and water, and salt, and it is fermented. White soy sauce uses 50% soybeans, 50% wheat. So as you can see, it's a lighter color and a much milder flavor. Dark soy sauces are very important in braising. And brown sauce, the Chinese brown sauce contains dark soy sauce. This is straight dark soy sauce. This is the mushroom flavored dark soy sauce, which is flavored with mushroom extract that's produced from shiitake, dried, preserved dry shiitake mushroom. I don't have any dried mushroom here, but that's another very common item in the Chinese pantry. Oyster flavor sauce. This is the Panda brand oyster flavor sauce. This is wonderful stuff. If you can't have shellfish, Rollin Brand makes a vegetarian oyster sauce, and I believe Lee Kum Ki does as well. You can use that. It's flavored with mushroom rather than being flavored with oysters. But this is a key ingredient in many dishes. For sweet ingredients, we have here hoisin sauce. If you've ever had Mongolian beef, this is one of the flavors in the sauce. It's also used 
to serve with Peking duck. And when it's served with Peking duck, it has often been bloomed in hot oil, so you'll see an oil slick on the best ones. For sweetener, very common is this yellow rock sugar, or yellow lump candy as it's also called. They also have a clear rock sugar, but this one has much more flavor. Almost looks like little topaz crystals. Sometimes you'll find a recipe that calls for maltose. Maybe you're making Chinese barbecue duck, or you're making a roast duck, or you're making Peking duck, or Chinese spirits, or char siu. It might call for maltose syrup. This is the best, you can find maltose syrup at Chinese markets, but this is an acceptable and delicious substitute honey. This is also used to make the honey walnut prawn or honey walnut chicken. Very easy to find Western ingredient that can be used. Let's talk about the oils that I have sitting over here. When you stir frying, the most traditional oil would be peanut oil. Also, avocado oil and grapeseed oil work great for stir fry. Then we have some flavoring oils. This is red chili oil or hot chili oil. This is a straight chili oil. This is a perfect ingredient for a stir fry. Second to that is this peppercorn chili oil. And this is chili oil that's seasoned and it also contains in it Sichuan peppercorns. This is black sesame seed oil. This is the darkest roasted sesame seed oil. This is your standard roasted sesame oil, which is not as dark as the black one. And here, this is blended sesame oil. And this is a blend of soybean oil and sesame seed oil. You might also see it blended with cottonseed oil. And what happens is they take this dark oil and they blend it with the uh, soybean or cottonseed oil. And what that does is it makes it milder in flavor. These two oils are very intense in flavor. And it's just sometimes it's easier to use and you might want a milder roasted sesame flavor. There are some spices we're going to talk about. Sesame seeds. This is roasted sesame seeds, which I think is the best for sprinkling on dishes because it's already roasted. We just mentioned the Sichuan peppercorns. This is the real Sichuan peppercorns. They're strong in flavor. These are numbing. You roast them and you usually roast them and grind them. I have some roasted and ground Sichuan peppercorns here. That's what it looks like. In China, they don't use black pepper much. They use white pepper. And this is pre-ground white pepper, but I also keep some in a grinder because I think it's best freshly ground. Five spice powder. This is the real five spice powder and it contains star anise, coriander, cinnamon, cloves, and cumin. Every recipe is slightly different. This is a nice one. It's made here in the US. It's very fragrant. When you're making char siu and roast duck, this is utmost importance. Some recipes call for curry powder. Might be the filling for a spring roll or the Singapore fried noodles calls for curry powder. This is the one I suggest. You may have seen the S&B Oriental curry powder in a container. This is my favorite. This is Madras curry powder. It's made here in the US under license from an Indian company. This is the best stuff. It contains no coloring, it's all natural. This does contain salt, so it also seasons as well. And now we come to our last ingredient. The elephant in the room. This is MSG. Everybody knows what this is. 
We either work with this product or you don't work with this product. Technically, 99% of everybody who has watched this video has ingested MSG. Everything you eat contains glutamate. Tomatoes, mushrooms, Parmesan cheese, canned anchovies that are tinned in oil, sardines can. Everything contains glutamates. Soy sauce, full of glutamates. This gets a truly bad rap when it comes to Chinese restaurants. This is an old jar. It used to have the G on the end. It was an old MSG jar that I cleaned out to preserve the label and that I put keep the MSG in here. It's little crystals. What happened back in probably I think it was the in the 1800s in Japan. That's where this company comes from. In Japan tribes would cook and they would pull their food together and they would eat and they were vegetarian. All the tribes were vegetarian. So they would eat their food. This one tribe was seasoning their food with dried seaweed that they ground up. And their food always tasted better. Ajinomoto, the company, they figured out how to synthesize and crystallize the glutamates that were found in seaweed. So that's where they came out with this. And this is the pure and natural one in the supermarket accent in a little bottle. It is also pure MSG and works fine if that's what you can find. This is an optional ingredient, folks. You do not have to use this, but we're going to talk why this got a bad rap. Back, I think it was in the 50s, decades and decades and decades ago, people were getting sick at Chinese restaurants. They needed something to blame, so they blamed the MSG when they were technically wrong. It ended up that they found out what was going on and what was going on was the suspect was improperly cooled rice. Chinese people when they eat rice at traditional dinners and banquets they're gonna eat steamed rice or sometimes sweet rice known as sticky rice. That's what they're going to eat. For an American, an American's going to eat with their Chinese meal. Americans eat fried rice. Yes, fried rice is traditional Chinese dish, but fried rice is most commonly used for a snack. When a person who misses the meal comes in late, you can cook them up a batch of fried rice. Though on occasion you'll see it in multi-course dish meals, you'll see fried rice. What was happening is Chinese restaurants made extra rice. They cooled it off, but they weren't cooling it enough before it went into the refrigerator. So the rice that was still cooling was in the danger zone. And it would sit there and that's where it gets microbes. And those microbes are what would get people sick when they would eat the fried rice made the next day. So it wasn't MSG's fault, it was improperly cooled rice. Because Americans are always gonna order fried rice. Now in the amount you use MSG when you're making Chinese recipes, you're not using a lot. This adds that fifth taste, which is umami. It's an umami seasoning. It wakes, adds that savory flavor. This is an optional ingredient. If a recipe contains mushroom soy sauce, for, exa 
for example, you don't need to put extra MSG in there. So we got to be nice to our MSG. And not every recipe uses MSG. Using certain recipes just to boost the flavors. One other product I'd like to show you here. This is called Sambal Olek. If you've ever had Sriracha sauce, this is how Sriracha sauce starts. This is ground fresh chili paste. This contains nothing but ground fresh chili with salt and acetic acid and some preservative in here. This is wonderful stuff. And this is how you, along with the chilies and the chili oil, this is how you make the authentic spicy food. Things like Mongolian beef, salt and pepper shrimp, or prawns. It's a wonderful item to cook with. And also a great condiment. This can be used with a little red color vinegar, a drop of chili of the seasoned chili oil, and a drop of soy sauce and become a great condiment for dim sum. One other ingredient I have not shown you here that I don't have right now is some Chinese mustard powder. Chinese mustard powder is easy to use. You mix it with water. The one thing you have to know about Chinese mustard powder is once you mix it with water, a reaction starts and it becomes hotter and hotter and hotter and does not stop. So you just got to be wary of your Chinese mustard. There is a restaurant that used to be located in Palo Alto right off the freeway. Ming's famous Chinese restaurant. It was originally opened by Johnny Kahn, a famous Chinese restaurateur of San Francisco. Who passed on in the early 70s, but Ming's was one of his restaurants that he opened up. And they always served their spring rolls and egg rolls with a little dish and it contained ketchup and Chinese mustard. Ketchup is another common ingredient in Chinese restaurant cuisine, especially westernized Chinese restaurant cuisine. You will see it. Sweet and sour often has ketchup in it. And that's my Chinese pantry, folks. In our next episode, we're going to feature in we're going to be in Injo's kitchen, and I'm going to show you how to make the Chinese soup stock. So make sure if you're following along in this series that you jump to the next episode, which is Injo's kitchen, where all the other episodes will be kept, and we'll make the Chinese soup stock. So until I see you again, goodbye. Mm -hmm.